Good day, and welcome to Lecture 11 of A History of Theology and Humor. Last week, we looked at Martin Luther and the Woodcut Wars, but we're going to go to a different kind of art now. In the post-Reformation comedy, we find the Dutch artist Peter Bruegel satirizing both the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. And in his great canvas that we see here, he has a fight between Carnival, which is the meat eaters, and Lent, which are the meat deniers, during this time in the season of holiness. Now, we look next at a really close little image from this great painting, and we see that he has created a conflict between the tavern, and you've got this very stout drunk uh, on a beer barrel with a pig's head, a chicken, sausages especially, because this is something you weren't supposed to eat during Lent, and he's even got a chicken pot pie on his head. He's sitting on this barrel, and what you see confronting him, almost in a joust-like play, is Lady Lent. She is ascetic. She's thin. She's wearing gray, almost in mourning. And she's holding a shovel with two herrings. In other words, on Fridays, you could eat fish. You could not eat any meat. But you have the Lutherans, and you have Zwingli and the Reformers, who, in one sense, eat whatever they want. And on the other, you have the Roman Catholics who will deny themselves during the season of Lent. Now, what we also see next from, from Peter Lent, uh, Peter Brugel, is uh, satires throughout this. And we see one image of a man and a woman walking behind a clown. And the clown with his motley on, his kind of brand of fire, symbolizes folly. And so men and women follow folly. And if you notice, there's an unlit lantern, this light of wisdom, but it's behind her. But as we say, at least it's in her position and not possession and not his. Next, we look at a larger canvas, too, of Bruegel's kind of proverbs from the Netherlands. And he had these visual jests on ordinary life, the kinds of things that go on and where we get a lot of the proverbs we recognize today. For example, when you look closely, I mean, you see just a myriad, almost a legion of, of little jests all over the place. And one of the proverbs was, to marry under a broomstick, which means living together before marriage, or big fish eat little fish, which is the story of any corporation or any university, or casting roses before swine, which sounds very familiar to us as casting your pearls before swine. But look at some of the details we're going to see here, and these all will indicate human foolishness. If you look right in the center of this image here, you see one man shearing a sheep and one man shearing pigs, which means that one has the advantage over another. There are privileges to certain groups and classes. And so he is mocking this sense that there is not the equality that we think would be there. Other images pop up that you'll recognize, banging one's head against a brick wall, which is what most of us do when we're raising, te raising teenagers belling the cat, or biting a brick pillar, which means being a religious hypocrite. Carrying fire and water, you can't make up your mind. You can't decide what to carry. Or able to tie the devil with a pillow, the bottom left corner. This means the woman is very obstinate, and even the devil can't handle it. Or the very deceptive putting a blue cloak on your man, which means hoodwinking and deceiving him. We move next to several others that are just fun to look at, to count one's chickens before they hatch, or to shit on the world, to not care about it, to piss against the moon, something very stupid, to gaze at the stork, to waste your time daydreaming, to fight over one bone, the two dogs that are doing there, or to cry over spilled porridge, things you can't change. And what Bruegel is doing with all of these is really giving us a sense of what the people's lives were and how there's humor in the everyday. But we move from this battle between Lent and Carnival, between the Roman Catholic and the Protestant, to see next the battles between Puritans and everyone. And we're going to look at Puritans today. And, and first we have these kind of medieval stereotypes of Roman Catholics and Puritans during Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday uh, or Shrove Tuesday. And it's where the Roman Catholics are very festive. They're fun. They're in the literature of Rabelais and Chaucer. And the Puritans are fairly strict and uptight and ascetic. 
And so this is going to be a stereotype we look at today. Now, not only did the Roman Catholics have problems, or the Puritans have problems with Roman Catholics, but we see next that they had problems with the Anglicans. Now, the Anglicans are the Protestants. They are the ruling class of Britain. And yet we're going to find, after the Reformation Wars, we have the wars of the dissidents, of those people who are on the margins, the Baptists, the Quakers, the Puritans, the Presbyterians, who are not Anglican, and Anglicans rule. And so here we have several kind of broadsheets and images. And the first one is we find that the Puritans, also known as separatists in some ways, and pilgrims, also known as brownists, um, they have their dog, and so do the Cavaliers, uh, the Anglicans, the Cavaliers. And so you attack your poodle on one hand, or you attack your you charge your pepper to kind of attack the other forces. And the roundheads were also looked as people who had given themselves over to the devil. Uh, these are also known as brownists. Now, next we look at kind of this, this overview of how the Puritans were caricatured uh, by the Anglicans during this time. And one Reverend Samuel Peters saw them both as, saw them in several ways. First, they were ignorant and stupid. In other words, they didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. Secondly, they were disapproving. They did not like anything. They would ban games and sports on Sunday. Third, they were covetous and, and hypocritical, particularly they thought about sex. And in many ways, the Puritans were seen as, say, the televangelists were about three decades ago. Now, that's one caricature, one stereotype of the Puritans. But there were other images of them as well. For, for example, Sir Thomas More, this man for all seasons that we looked at last week, saw them as frightfully giddy and liberal. He said, they are drunk of a lewd lightness of mind and a vain gladness of heart. In other words, here were people who believed in the grace of God. They believed that their sins were forgiven, and this brought a gladness of heart. Now, we're going to see these two contrasting images of the Puritans as we move from Britain over to America. One, they see them as very uptight, and the other as very liberal and open for their age. When we look at the Restoration comedies that come during the time of Charles II, we find that um, they are the people who dally with their female benefactors, and they have these wonderful names taken from plays of the day. For example, Snar, Snarl in Thomas Shadwell's The Virtuo, or Mr. Smirk and Mr. Scruple, or Trollope's Mr. Stiggins. In, in Dickens' Pickwick Papers, uh, Mr. Stiggins, and maybe even a name like Cyrus Snape in Harry Potter. These are all Puritan names that kind of make fun of them. Now, next we look at the kind of critiques of Puritan preaching. And Puritan preaching became famous because people would take the text and they would begin to extemporize. They would begin to kind of move beyond kind of a printed text. The one Gloucester preacher thank God for not turning a child in his congregation who was whining into a toad. And so people would sit up. Another carpenter par parson reportedly preached that if your fingers would drop off, they would drop off if you took communion unworthily. Many complained that their freaky style of preaching was filled with whining delivery and ridiculous postures and grimaces and that their terrible, ill-favored wry mouths were sufficient to even scare the very devil himself. And so there were people who would sit in the congregation, and there was one woman who sat, and the preacher says, now the devil may be among us, and you must close your eyes. If you open your eyes, the devil will possess you. And one woman opened one eye and said, I can handle to lose one eye. I'll risk it. I just want to see this preacher. Well, next we move however, to other rules that the Puritans set forth. And they ruled that Sunday music would be banned. And the canons, those in charge, said you cannot play music on Sunday. Only tub thumping or preaching is allowed. And so the hypocrisy just allowed this voice to drone on and on. And the Puritans basically would play music only through their mouths and noses. Now, next we see Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the Commonwealth, tub thumping himself. And he is preaching to a Puritan congregation here. And in one 
1623 girl complained that whenever her new village minister takes his little green book in his hand, we shall have such a deal of bibble babble that I am weary to hear it. And I take a good nap, for he speaks against us for our dancing. We had a good parson here before, but now we have a Puritan. Next, we see that the length of Puritan sermons and their prayers were proverbial as well. They would go on and on, almost like some contemporary PowerPoint presentations. Some things seemed interminable. But back next, we see that the purchase of an hourglass was a good sign. It was a sign of the switch over to a godly religion when sermons were the right length. Uh, at Chew Magda in Somerset, the sermons were apparently so long that the whole congregation went to sleep for three hours until the preacher called out, Awake, sinners! And they sat up very quickly. Next, we see that the Puritans did also attack the theater. And the Reformers were not against laughter, per se, but only that gratuitous laughter that served no other purpose but to amuse. They wanted laughter to also teach. Now, the Puritan strictures and their laws on laughter were focused in the theater and also in other things like bear baiting or cockfighting, uh, things that we would find with dog fighting today. We find it just unconscionable that people would participate in this. And so in this way, the Puritans were quite liberal. And they were also against gambling. And so we see that there are many things that they stand against. But theater was one of the main things. And we're going to look at a couple weeks on Tartuffe, who is seen as the French Puritan in a comic play. Next, we find that there was one uh, brownstone, uh, brown as they called him, and his name was Parson Irving. Uh, he was one of the great brimstone merchants. He would preach hell and damnation and fires. And he was accused of being ugly and a merry Andrew, which was a clown or a common quack, a brawler, a swearer, and quite subversive. And so here on one side, you see King George, and he is there with Shakespeare, a bust of Shakespeare. And on their side, on the curtains, they have true religion. They've got faith, hope, and charity. And they've got the plays of Shakespeare, King Lear, and Romeo and Juliet, and Hamlet, that teach moral lessons using humor. But on the other side, you have the Puritans, <coughs> which include this Parson Irving, and he is telling them that they are damned, uh, basically the hypocrisy of the Puritans against the theater. Now, next we go to how before the Puritans had persecuted the English Roman Catholics, including members of Shakespeare's own family. And Shakespeare is going to remember this. In fact, in 1586, there was a character whose name was Sir Francis Knollys. And uh, he was the father of Sir William, another Nolis. And he urged the banishment of all recusant Catholics and the exclusion from public office of all who married recusants. Those are people who would not deny their Catholic faith. Now, Shakespeare's father had been forced from public office for his refusal to attend Anglican services and was fined for his recusancy. Such spite on the part of English Pur Puritans may have animated Shakespeare's imagination when he actually gets a little bit of revenge on them. He will ridicule the Puritans with a villain, Malvolio, from Twelfth Night. This villain name means ill will. And we're going to find this in a lot of the names given to Puritans. So mal meaning ill and volio, volition, the will. So ill will comes this Puritan person. Where we see this next is Malvolio is clearly presented as a Puritan in the play, particularly by the servant, this cheeky servant, Maria. And we think that he's possibly modeled on the Puritan William Knollys, the first Earl of Banbury. Banbury, this, this William Knollys had a multicolored beard. Um, and you find that they're white at the roots, there's yellow in the middle and black at the ends. And it's, it's very ostentatious, very pretentious. That's there. And so he becomes an object of ridicule in Queen Elizabeth's court for his efforts to kind of court young ladies, even a teenage girl, and uh, yet to be proper as, as a Puritan. 
Now, Maria in the play Twelfth Night mentions Malvolio's beard as something of which he is absurdly proud. And he's lampooned and burlesque for his vainglorious and foolhardy efforts to woo this young lady in much the same way as a ballad about the Nolies did. And so Noli was known as Hardy Beard the Clown, and Malvolio becomes this same clown. However, next, what we see is at the end of the play, you may remember Malvolio frantically rushes off stage. He shouts, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. And Shakespeare expected his audiences to follow him with the scornful laughter that he thought was the business of comical satire to arouse. They laugh at the pretensions of this villain. However, within 50 years of Shakespeare's writing of Twelfth Night, Malvolio and his ilk had stormed to power. They killed King Charles I and they closed the theaters, finally getting the revenge as Malvolio had promised. But next we find there's a character of Shakespeare's that bothered the Puritans just as much. And this is the comic character Falstaff, one of our favorites. He embodied many things that offended the Puritans. And while Puritans were parodies as hypocritical windbags who secretly indulged in the excesses they publicly deplored, like lechery and gluttony, Falstaff also stands for something else. He stands for the idea of obsessive play and pleasure as an end in itself. And it was precisely this notion that the anti-theatrical critics identified in the commercial theater. Falstaff laughed too gratuitously. Now, several other satirists came next to kind of really look at the Puritans and to satirize them. And one of them was Bishop John Hall. He claimed to be the very first English satirist, but he forgot about Langland and Chaucer and many other people who had come before. But there's a tendency to think that you are the first in anything you do. Now, Hall was in many ways a good Anglican bishop, and he tried to bring Calvinists and Arminians together, people who believed in predestination and free will. And so he tried to kind of wed them together and bring them into peace. And so he wrote Via Media, The Way of Peace. But he also decided that isn't working, so I'm going to write my toothless satires. Satires that basically can't really bite you, but may sting you. And what we see next is one of his famous definitions of satire. The satire should be like the porcupine that shoots sharp quills out in each angry line. So it may not bite you, but its quills are going to stick into you. In fact, next we see where he satirized. He mocked how the wealthy Anglicans tried to trick their way into heaven by being buried with money in the robes of St. Francis. It's as if many people gave major donations to the church, just as they were on their deathbed. He mocks them and says it may be a little too late. But what we see next is that Hall angered another satirist, John Marston. John Marston wanted to be the first satirist, and so he was very displeased and angry. And, and he would have literary feuds with uh, Bishop Hall and Ben Johnson and everybody else, and he kind of created his work called The Malcontent. And of course, you understand the root meaning the etymology of those two words, mal, meaning again, ill will, bad, content. You're not really content. And, and he wasn't. He was an angry critic. He was the Don Rickles of his day. He thought that satire came from satire, those kind of goat-footed creatures that were very wild. And he said, therefore, our satire needs to be very rough and coarse. He was characterized not by his enemies, but by his friends, as one who pisses against the world, someone who was not happy with his own life. Next, we see that the Archbishop Whitgift, who worked for King James, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and King James I, and he had a star chamber, uh, which would gather to kind of deal with some of these problems and censor the works. He attacked Marston for very obscene and misanthropic works because he was just against human beings. He hated all of mankind. In fact, one of his satires in Malcontent follows a character called Malavol, which again is another kind of evil name. He's a very sarcastic court jester. 
And he attacks the Italians with his caustic wit. And finally, looking at them all, he says, basically, it concludes that man is the slime of this dung pit. There's no hope for humans whatsoever. Now, what Marston did next, however, was something a little better, something a little more acceptable. And he wrote what were called drolleries. Drolleries were short comic sketches. They were the kind of skits that a young life group would put on. And they originated before the Puritan time in England with scenes like from Hamlet in the graveyard scene where he would take the skull of poor Yorick, the comedian, or when Bottom is turned to an ass in. These were wonderful little skits. And Marston wrote one called The Dutch Courtesan. And The Dutch Courtesan is about two friends. One is the relaxed and pleasure-loving free will, Preville. And free will, you realize, is someone who is Arminian, someone who believes that our choices matter. And he has an affair with a Dutch courtesan. But he goes tired of her, and he realizes he needs to repent of his sins and move on and marry a good woman. So he leaves her. He abandons her. But he says, you know what? I'm going to give her a gift. And he brings this repressed Puritan, Mel Hero, meaning not very happy, to meet her. And she begins to manipulate him. She says, if you will kill free will for me, my former lover, and bring me his ring, then I'm going to submit to you. And this obsessive Mal Haroe says, okay. And he goes and he gets the ring, steals the ring from the Freeville, but Freeville just vanishes. So the whore then has Mal Haroe arrested for murder. Poor guy, he can't win in any way. But Freeville turns up and then the prostitute is imprisoned herself. But you notice in this kind of little drollery how free will can leave sin. Free will can be forgiven and free will can move on. But the unhappy Calvinist here finds himself totally wrecked. Now, next we find at the end of his life, Marston was known for kind of quips like, all the fat is in the fire, or wink and shut your apprehensions up. But after his kind of frenemy feuds with people like Ben Johnson, he finally left satire. He realized it has very little effect, and, and I'm just becoming a cantankerous old man. So he became a reader at the Oxford Bodleian Library, and then in 1609, he became a priest. And when he finally died, about 40 years later, he had one more jest. He altered what was known as the traditional tombstone epitaph of memoria sacrum, that this person is sacred to the memory. There's a holy memory we have about this person, too. Oblivion sacrum, sacred to oblivion, which he is. He was forgotten until today. Next, we move to the propaganda against the Puritans and moving to, from Britain to the United States. And here, because of their legalism, that nothing could be done on Sunday, there were blue laws all over the place, a Puritan would hang his cat on Monday because it killed a mouse on Sunday. We see that next in another great kind of illustration, an engraving here where the modern Puritan would still hang this poor emaciated little cat with everyone, particularly obnoxious little boys, laughing in the background at what they do and how they follow these rules. But the great satire against Presbyterians and Puritans came next. And this is Samuel Butler. And Samuel Butler, in the late 17th century, had served first as a clerk to various imposing Puritan lawyers and judges. And they just made him miserable as this poor little Anglican. And so after the Commonwealth, he got his revenge during the Restoration with his couplets in this novel he wrote called Hudibras. Now, Hudibras is a really long, but it's a, it's a very popular, mock heroic satirical poem. It made fun of the ideas of chivalry and the idea of knighthood and of the idea of the Puritan general. And so it took all of the kind of problems that you would see in the English Civil Wars, personal, political, religious, and it would make fun of them and burlesque them. And so in one sense, it's like an English Don Quixote looking at pious Puritans. But what we see next is that it's not as sympathetic to Hudibras as Cervantes was to Don Quixote. In fact, Hudibras is very greedy and vain and stupid this colonel in Cromwell's army. And he and his squire, who's known as Ralpho, 
were part of the roundheads, these kind of Presbyterians and Puritans that really sought to beat people in the head so they would accept their theological doctrine. So they tried to prove their doctrine orthodox by apostolic blows and knocks. If you beat someone up long enough, they're going to believe what you believe, or so the satire goes. Now next we see the kind of engraving of the frontispiece um, here in this book illustration, very elaborate, done by Hogarth, William Hogarth, that we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. And notice again how the idea of satire suggests from its roots of not the satire, this medley dish, this fruit salad that the Romans had, but from the satire here, this kind of goat-footed, kind of little demonic Dionysian character uh, that is there, that is very rough and coarse. And so satire during this time in Britain was seen as something that was very unrepressed, very wild uh, that is there. And all the pleasures of wine and music and dancing and women uh, would come out in this kind of celebration. Now, next we see Hogarth's illustration of these two, this short, dumpy, rotund, and very arrogant Hudibras, the colonel on his horse, and the very uptight, stiff squire, Ralpho. And the two of them are going to go across the countryside with different adventures. One of the adventures we see next is um, how the, the book is not only going to attack the hypocrites of Cromwell, but also those libertines of Charles II who bring back bear baiting. They bring back the theater, a very raunchy theater. They bring back all kinds of gambling and things that they see as fun. And so it's going to attack both. And you see here that Hudibra is confronting this crowd, this mob of, of basically people who are just enjoying life again. And so again, this idea of the Battle of Lent and Carnival is now kind of replaced in kind of the dissidents and the Anglicans that are there. The next thing that, that we find is this whole opening that uh, Butler wrote. For his religion, for the religion of Hudibra, it was fit to match his learning and his wit. Twas Presbyterian, true blue. For he was of that stubborn crew of errant saints, whom all men grant to be the true church militant. Okay, the church militant is this powerful fortress of a church. And here, the, the militant church is one that doesn't just hold on to the faith, but is one that goes out and attacks others uh, for not believing what they believe. This church militant, such as do, build their faith upon the holy text of pike and gun. In other words, they use force to demonstrate their orthodoxy. They decide all controversies by infallible artillery, not by infallible word of God, but by arms and prove their doctrine orthodox by apostolic blows and knocks. Here is the great fighting spirit of the Puritans. However, what we find next is that Hudibras' own catechism, the way he is taught, is they beat, they try to beat this kind of Anglican doctrine into him. And they're all wearing their mummer's masks, they're having fun. It's kind of a playful kind of fight that is there of trying to teach him that you cannot force someone into belief with all of these orthodox blows and knocks. So Hudibra ends up next with describing how clergy go wrong. And here they're in the stocks, which is going to be kind of ironic because it's going to happen quite a bit. But he makes fun of those preachers and televangelists. And he says, what makes all doctrines plain and clear? About 200 pounds a year. Just pay them off. And what which was proved true before, proved false again? 200 more. So if you give people enough money, they're going to change their doctrine. It's an awful, but sometimes true, idea. Hudibra was known next for several of his phrases that we still remember today, where he says, I smell a rat. And so the idea, whenever you smell a rat, um, you realize it comes from Hudibra. Not that it's... Uh, from Ratatouille or from Mickey Mouse, but he looks at his little servant, Ralpho, and says, thou dost prevaricate, you're a liar, because I smell a rat here somewhere. And that we can thank Samuel Butler. But Samuel Butler next gives us some other things that I think are quite humorous. He says, what we need is a sense of humor keen enough to show a man his own absurdities will keep him from the commission of all sins, or nearly all, 
save those worth committing. And so a sense of humor keeps us from some sins, but not the ones we want to enjoy. He gets a little body when he says, spare the rod and spoil the child, which really is symbolic, almost Freudian, to say the best way to prevent conception is to spare your rod. Don't use it. Brigands and thieves demand your money or your life. Women require both. And man is the only animal that laughs and has a state legislator. Something that should make us tragically sad, and yet the only thing to do really is to laugh. Now next we come to a gentle and good Anglican man, one of my favorites, and he has just a, a few things to say to us about humor. And this is Isaac Barrow. They called him low of stature, which means he was short and quite disheveled. So I like to describe myself now as low of stature. But what we find next about this brilliant polymath is that he also discovered the fundamental theorems of calculus, along with Pascal. In fact, Newton was his student. And so much that we've learned about Newton comes from this gentle, quiet man. And in this little cartoon, we find uh, the father saying, Gracie, I don't think this is the place for a Newton momentum ball experiment out in the playground where some kids realize what's going to happen. But we're going to find the wonderful laws and fundamental theorems of movement and physics occurring through Isaac Barrows. But next, let's look at some of the things that he did. In what he called this very pleasant and jocular age, he gave a sermon on Ephesians 5, 4, against foolish talking and jesting. And it's basically a sermon on evil speaking. But he does something different because he says it's not just about jokes that we're talking about here, but it's about something else. And he says there are two kinds of laughter. There's the playful mirth that brings friends together and a very spiteful mean wit that divides people a very inclusive laughter that is part of the community of Christ, and an exclusive laughter that excludes and divides people. And so this is where, like St. Thomas Aquinas, he has the idea of eutropelia. Eutropelia means a good turning, E-U meaning good, and tropelia, the turning, the twisting. And so he says, we are given eutropelia as a gift, a fruit of the Holy Spirit that is there to give us cheerfulness. And he gives us several little axioms to follow next. First, he says, laughter should be welcome when it sweetens conversations and it maintains good humor among people. Christians, he says, should never knit the brow and squeeze the brain to be always sadly dumpish or seriously pensive. Second, he says, one may speak foolishly, morologia, when exposing things apparently base and vile, such as Elijah did when he mocked the prophets of Baal, or in correcting lethargic stupidity, when someone is just so lazy they won't even bring their food to their mouth. Third, he says, let your speech be seasoned as salt. And the word salt here is translated wit. Let your speech be seasoned with wit useful for cleansing and curing some sores that you have or others have. So your jesting may be commodious for approving vices, pleasantly rubbing the faults of some who will not endure a direct reproof. Laughter may tickle, but should not sting the heart. And in one sense, this kind of pleasant rubbing is very much like a massage. When you receive a massage, there's something, there's almost anything you can tell someone. And when your wife comes up to your husband and she rubs his shoulder and said, I spent $1,000 today on something that I really didn't need, it doesn't matter because you have been massaged. The laughter, the tickling, this wonderful feeling has come over you and you're oblivious of any money that has left the household. But fourth, Barrow says we need to prefer humor over yelling or fighting. Answer slander or unjust reproach with laughter. When you're accused of something by the devil, laugh. And remember, this is what Luther did, but he used much more vulgar and coarse ways. But Barrow says, laugh at those things that you're accused of. And agree, say, yes, I'm not only guilty of that, but I'm guilty of so much more. But I am forgiven, and there is grace there. 
He sees jests as weapons for truth and virtue, and one shouldn't surrender the sharp blades of battle, lest only folly be allowed to swing the sword. So the sword of God is there to give you this humor, and jest is a good rhetorical persuasive tool to instill good doctrine and illustrate the truth with delight. And finally, he argues, laughter is the abuse of jesting. Laughter can be abused in jesting, wit, and fancy, and that becomes dangerous. Every good thing, our love, our desire, our appetites can become degenerate and corrupted. So can laughter. Now, I, next we have one of his, one grateful little scene uh, about Barrow and one of the very hedonistic kind of wicked men, uh, the Earl of Rochester, who was very libertine, and he wrote all kinds of body poetry and was part of what was known as the Merry Gang, gang of uh, Charles II's court. And however, one day uh, they met and uh, near the king's chambers, and the Earl bowed down a little bit before the scholar and said, I have yours, doctor, to the knee strings. And Barrow bowed lower and said, I am yours, my lord, to the shoe tie. Oh, said Rochester, yours, doctor, down to the ground. Pharaoh said, yours, my lord, to the center of the earth. And Rochester, not to be outdone, said, yours, doctor, to the lowest pit of hell. Pharaoh paused and said, there, my lord, I must leave you. And so you use laughter to kind of respond to those accusations there. And next and finally, we see about Beryl this good turn. This eutropelia is something we need to practice of using jokes to laugh at yourself and play to generate this kind of cheerfulness or this spiritual joy, which is part of the Christian community. Now we leave that and go next to the harsh new world where the Puritans have come with their prayers and their piety to kind of establish a settlement and a colony and a place that is very tough and difficult. And so next we see that the images we get of these Puritans are very solemn because these are difficult times. They are going through quite a strenuous and challenging set of circumstances that is very difficult to endure. And so that's why we see next that they'd set up all of these blue laws. In fact, when I first came to Virginia Beach, I remembered there were blue laws and the stores would be shut and there was still this kind of Massachusetts Puritan law down here uh, in, in the South. And it was, it was kind of wonderful and quiet. There'd be no traffic or anything else. But we see that the blue laws were enforced to keep the Sabbath holy. And so many activities were prohibited on the Lord's day, including washing your dishes, playing sports, and even kissing your wife in public. And there is an anecdote about a Captain Kemble who returned to Boston after being at sea for three years. He met his wife at the front door and kissed her right on the doorstep. It was a Sunday, and for this lewd and unseemly behavior, he was ordered to spend two hours in the public stocks. Not a fair consequence after three years away. But we see in this kind of Puck magazine that there is the exposition and there's Niagara Falls, and these are two things that the Puritan couldn't stop on Sunday because of the money put into the exposition and the fact the falls can never be stopped. They're going to continue. Next, we find that some of the laws that the Massachusetts Bay Colony did institute, the ordinance, no lace or fancy clothes. And on Sundays, people would wear their best, and this was not right. You dressed demurely and modest. No games on Sundays, no smoking in public, no gambling, no theaters, no Christmas. Uh, and all of this would lead to the 20th century satirist H.L. Mencken's quip that Puritis, Puritanism is the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy, and we've got to stop it. But all of these things were to keep order and to keep people from sinning with envy or lust or any other sin. Now, next we find that one of the most controversial was the banning of Christmas. And so the public notice that we see here is the observation of Christmas having been deemed a sacrilege because it had become too pagan. The exchanging of gifts and greetings, dressing in fine clothing, feasting, and similar satanical practices are hereby forbidden, with the offender liable to a fine of five shillings. And so what we see next is that when Father Christmas does come to London or to the Puritan villages, he is told to keep out. You're not welcome here. 
And, oh Christmas, welcome, do not fear, says the Anglican. The Anglican will invite him anywhere. He says, Christmas, Father Christmas says, I'm only bringing good cheer uh, that is there. So that leads us next to this kind of enduring stereotype of the Puritan. And Nathaniel Hawthorne is one of the main culprits who will kind of create this lack of cheerfulness, this lack of neutropelia uh, that is there. And this comes next in one of his famous books written years after, decades after, um, the witch trials and everything else. And that's the Scarlet Letter. And, and you have um, this, the little kind of film clips that we see here, too. Now, the problem was Hawthorne uh, had some relatives who were allegedly on the judge's trial. And in the judge's trial, one of them was one who condemned the witches there in Salem. And so this kind of idea was haunting him, and he even changed his name, took they put the E on where they didn't have an E. And Hawthorne is the one that gives us this very severe image. In fact, if you look at the next one, you can see people, Puritans putting people in stocks. And then there's Hawthorne's attempt at a sequel. Instead of the scarlet A, there is the blue B. And it just didn't work. I'm sorry. Next, we see some parodies of Puritan Valentine day cards. You've bewitched me. There is no other explanation for the gophers in my garden. I need you to help raise livestock and crops, or surely we will starve to death come winter. Or next, you almost make my heart dance, and dancing is forbidden. Or next, roses are red, violets are blue, and neither are useful or necessary at all. But next, we find that Puritans were not as dour as we thought. In fact, Pulitzer Prize winning Stanford University historian Carl Degler observed the Sabbath keeping, anti liquor, and anti sex attitudes usually attributed to the Puritans are a 19th century addition, think Hawthorne, to the much more moderate and wholesome view of life's evils held by some of the early settlers of New England. And so in one of his pivotal interpretations of American history, he shows us next that those pilgrims partied more than we realized. Leland Riken also looked at these worldly saints who could enjoy the life that God had given them. Next, we find that even Puritans would drink from pewter mugs in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The men would gather and the men could laugh. And next, we find that there are some interesting customs that they have of courting sticks and bundlings. In the courting stick, we find that young pilgrim couples could whisper to each other through exchanging endearments through a long wooden stick called a courting stick. You could whisper naughty or body things or whatever you wanted without your chaperone hearing. And then there was also the process of bundling. This allowed unmarried couples to sleep together clothed or bundled with a bundle board between them. However, you did have high unwed pregnancy rates, but there was no stigma as long as you got married before the child was born. And some believed that women must have an orgasm in order to conceive a child. So a sexually dissatisfied woman was able to divorce her husband for that reason. Quite controversial today, but then, we look next how Puritans liked sex in marriage. They were called to increase and multiply, insomuch that one of the great Puritans' fathers, uh, church, church fathers, was named Increase Mather. And it was Cotton Mather, but Increase, I think, had a better name and much more enjoyable. Next, we find two Puritans, Terry Linval and his wife Karen. And here we are. And we are celebrating. We are trying to change the whole image of what Puritans are really like. And we were told in this image to go ahead and increase and multiply. But we had already had our children. Next, we move to a more pagan pilgrim. And this is Thomas Morton. He was the Lord of Marymount. He left all the other Puritans uh, from Plymouth. And he started his own plantation there. He had freed his own indentured servants, and he erected a maypole, which we're going to see is the major problem. He promoted a lot of interracial sexual couplings between Marymount's bachelors, and there were a lot more men, and their local Indian brides. 
but he's going to be shipped back to England, where he's going to write his own critique and satire of the Plymouth settlers, called the New English Canaan. Now, we go back next to Governor Winthrop, his city upon a hill, this kind of light for the nations, filled with the elect community, when he wrote the model of Christian charity. But we find it's a cavalier, someone from UVA, who is Thomas Morton, this avid sportsman. They won the national championship in basketball. He's an Anglican. He's loyal to King Charles I, but he's a rascal. And he is going to be charged by the magistrates and the judges for stealing a canoe from the Indians, as well as for many other misdemeanors. In fact, next we find that William Bradford, the governor of Plymouth, recounts Morton's first set of crimes. He said, this Morton, having more craft than honesty, he is a rascal, watches for an opportunity. And then he goes and gets some strong drink and some other junkets and made them all a feast, both the Native Americans and his own men. And after they were married, he began to tell them he would give them some good counsel. Join me. Come and have fun with me as partners in my plantation. You see, he says, that you will be free from service and we will converse and trade and plant and live together as equals and support and protect one another. There's a wonderful playfulness about Thomas Morton. But we see next, well, as I mentioned, he's sent back to England by men, which he called as onerous as Turks. And so banished back there, he says, I'm going to sharpen my quill to prick the sect of cruel schismatic, these Puritans. And he wrote this new Canaan, a reference to this land of flowing of milk and honey and the land that he is going to kind of create at Marymount. So he sticks his quills into people like Captain Littleworth. He's worth very little. This was the character John Endicott. And the Master Bubble, another unnamed minister, and then to his arch enemy, Captain Shrimp, Miles Standish. And we know next this whole story of uh, Captain Standish we'll get to. But for Morton, Puritan denoted these separatists that keep much ado about the tithe of mint and cumin, about the little things of the law they worry about. They trouble their brains more than reason will require about things that are indifferent to what the gospel is about. In his little pamphlet, How Not to Colonize, was a manual on how to feast, how to enjoy sports and hunts and music and dance and entertainment, how to enjoy trade and cohabitations, and all manner of revel. And so next we see that he is called the Lord of Misrule. He establishes a community called Marymount, a mount of merriment, a mount of mirth. But he sells guns and rum to Native Americans for be beaver pelts and furs. And one of the poems that came out of this was, there are lasses in beaver coats, come away with me. You'll be welcome to us night and day. Then drink and be merry, merry, merry boys. Let all you delight in Hyman's joys. And so there is quite an invitation to lascivious behavior and play. Now it takes us back next to Hawthorne's other short story, called the Maypole of Marymount, where he again will create the jollity and doom contending for an empire. The Puritans again are seen as doomsayers and they're compared to the revelers of Marymount. Those who devils and ruined souls with their superstition peopled the black wilderness. This is next where Hawthorne wrote, woe to the youth or maiden who did but dream of a dance. And the dance for the Puritans, they might, but it's going to be around a whipping post, which is called the Puritan Maypole, as opposed to the Marymount Maypole. We see next that John Ritham wrote about the devil would never cease to disturb our peace and to raise up instruments one after another. And the instrument that seemed that Thomas Morton raised up is this Maypole. And it's very similar in the, to the Hebrew prophets of the Asherim, of these kind of phallic poles that people would go and dance around and in kind of orgy, enjoy them, each other. And so you, you find that Winthrop is concerned about this kind of sexual license that is occurring here. But for Thomas Morton and his people, they're going to find bribes. And bribes. Well, next we come to Miles Standish, who was trying to find his own bride. And he's the one who's going to pull down Morton. He's going to be uh, this short little guy, Captain Shrimp, who brings an end to Marymount. And next, we find that while there is no historical evidence for the Plymouth colony lore, 
that Miles Standish asked Mayflower crew member John Alden to propose marriage for him to Priscilla Mullins, the tale is also going to be embellished in the 19th century by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Courtship of Miles Standish. And it's a wonderful little story that we tell our people that our children, you need to go and ask yourself and not have somebody else ask somebody else on a date for you. Uh, next, we find the same kind of story kind of used in a satire where you have a shy Theodore Roosevelt as John Alden talking to Priscilla Mullins, who is the Republican Party, who's sitting before a fireplace with a spinning wheel nearby, while William Taft is Miles Standish, kind of Captain Shrimp out there standing outside the door. And Roosevelt is trying to get the Republican Party to marry him rather than Taft. But next, we see some images of this kind of maypole, where little girls are trained to kind of go around and they do not realize what's coming with puberty. The next we find, even in cartoons, there's this wonderful kind of series of images of the maypole, of dancing around in ways that are just fun and frolicsome, but also inviting other sexual dangers. And then one last one, where you find the maids in kind of an early silent Hollywood film, kind of dancing around this maypole and the man stands in the middle. In contrast, next, we find death finding two Quakers sitting quietly at church in Philadelphia. And quote the devil, we shall not differ. And he let them alone like figures of stone, for he could not make them stiffer. And so we find the very upright Quakers of Philadelphia looking like they're already dead. But in Philadelphia, there's another character that we see next, and we close with him. And this is Benjamin Franklin. He is the father of American humor. He writes so many quips, when trouble knocked on the door, but hearing laughter hurried away. And so in his poor Richard's almanac, in giving the weather and the tides, but giving lots of wisdom from poor Richard telling us what is good and wise and what is foolish, he creates a wonderful community of laughter. In fact, next we find that he, as a 16-year-old apprentice to the print, printer, wrote a satiric essay that was published under the non de plume of Silence Do Good. The Silence Do Good is allegedly a middle-aged minister's widow. And it's going to attack different Calvinist bigwigs like Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was wonderful and prescient in many ways because he advocated inoculation against smallpox. But in other ways, the, the Salem witch trials and other things, he's very sketchy. But he wrote several books and Franklin took those books and created his pseudonym from two of Mather's books. The first was Essays to Do Good, where we have Silence Do Good. And the second one was Silentarius, a brief essay on the holy silence and godly patience that sad things are to be entertained with all. And so he takes these two and he creates this character, this wonderful character, Silence Do Good. Now, years later, we'll find next, Franklin actually visits Mather and he goes through his library. But as they were leaving the library, Mather suddenly says, Stu, Stu. And Franklin didn't understand and he hit his head on a low beam. And Mather, who never missed a chance to give instruction and teach, said, Benjamin, you are young and have the world before you. Stoop as you go through it, and you will miss many hard thumps. And years later, Benjamin Franklin wrote to his son, I often think of it when I see pride mortified and misfortunes brought upon people by carrying their heads too high. And so Franklin learned humility at this age from someone he had satirized, someone he had made fun of, taught him to be humble, to not think of himself more highly than he should, and to stoop, stoop. Next, we see that Franklin mocked the kind of numbskulls who would send their children to Harvard. As their purses could afford it, he said, such parents send their children to the temple of learning, where for want of a suitable genius, they learn little more than how to carry themselves handsomely or how to enter a room genteely, which might as well be acquired at a dancing school. And from whence these students return after an abundance of trouble and charge 
as great blockheads as ever, only more proud and self-conceited. And so Franklin took on everyone. And here we see a statue of him that has not yet been brought down because the pigeon there needs him. This is the great image of Philadelphia. But we find next that this inventor of the quintessential American humor wrote wonderful little quips and couplets. When men and women die, a poet sung, his heart, the last part moves, her last part, the tongue. Or, he is a fool who makes his doctor his heir. Or our best that we always must remember when we visit people, fish and visitors stink in three days. Next, we find that even though he believed in God, he was uncomfortable with both Calvinism and deism. Deism and Calvinism both denied free will. But the great thing that he gave us is the quote that beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. The last thing we see about him is next, is that he wrote a little play about Miss Polly Baker, who was quite a kind of wild licentious. She could have grown up in Marymount. And uh, she fools around with a lot of men. And she justifies her frisky affections and her wanton behaviors in producing many bastards because she says that she is serving this new country and our new country really needs more people. And so I'm giving them plenty of citizens who will be good men and women. Next, we find that he gives advice to young men on the choice of a mistress, to those who could not marry because there weren't enough women around. And so Franklin advises and he recommends to these young men, in all your loves, in all your amours, you should prefer old women. And for him, old women are anybody over 40. He says, here are the reasons that you should choose old women. First, they know more. Their conversation is much more interesting. There's no hazard of children. They can tend you when you're sick. They're less likely to rouse scandal or disease. They are better lovers. They know what they're doing. The sin is less. And they are so grateful. And so you see this lover of many women, Franklin, but devoted to one wife as well, still goes out there and does some naughty things. Next, we see that Franklin did invent all kinds of American humor. He says, everyone has an equal white right to be happy. And if you're not happy, Franklin argued, then there's something the matter with you, not the world, but with you. And one of his little known tracks was, fart proudly. It's a gift that God has given us, and we must use it even as much as we sing. Now we close next with Benjamin Franklin's heir a comic whose name is known, who's known as Stephen Wright. And he once said, half the people you know are below average. His mind, like Franklin's, could see ordinary things from odd perspectives. For example, 99% of lawyers give the rest a bad name. Never borrow money or borrow money from pessimists. They don't expect it back. 42.7 of all statistics are made up on the spot. All those who believe in psychokinesis, raise my hand. The early bird may get the worm. The second mouse gets the cheese. I almost had a psychic girlfriend, but she left me before we met. I intend to live forever. So far, so good. A lot of people are afraid of heights, not me. I'm afraid of wits. The human body is made up of 98% water. That means everybody is that far away from drowning. So we find that Stephen Wright becomes the heir of Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin sets a foundation for those who can believe in God and laugh like a cavalier or like a Puritan. Next week, we move to the Augustan age of England. I will see you then. <laughs>